Hi everyone, Dr. Mike here. In this video, we're going to talk about the esophagus and a little bit about gastroesophageal reflux. Now, the esophagus is a conduit. It's a pipe that sends food from the pharynx, which is the back of the throat, down to the stomach. Now, the pipe's around about 25 centimeters long. It's a very muscular tube and it's made up of two types of muscle. It's made up of skeletal muscle, which we can control consciously. That's actually the upper third of this 25 centimeter tube is skeletal muscle. And then the lower two thirds of this 25 centimeter tube is actually smooth muscle, which we don't consciously control. Now, in order for muscle to contract, which it needs to for the esophagus, it needs to be innervated by nerves. And the most important nerve here is the vagus nerve, controlling the esophagus to contract and relax in this wave-like motion termed peristalsis. Now, you can break the esophagus up into three major parts, the cervical, the thoracic, and the abdominal areas. If we look at the cervical esophagus, you'll find that it begins at around about the cricoid cartilage. So what's the cricoid? cartilage, find your laryngeal prominence, which is also termed your Adam's apple. Both males and females have an Adam's apple. It's a secondary sexual characteristic that's exaggerated by testosterone, but both males and females have it. Feel the laryngeal prominence, then move down and you'll feel a squishy part, and then go below that and you'll feel another bit of cartilage, and that's the cricoid. That is where your esophagus begins, at the cervical area. Now, if you were to correspond that to your vertebrae, it's around about C6. All right? Now, this cervical area, you can see that the cervical esophagus is actually sitting behind or posterior to the aorta and the trachea as well. So you can see it hidden in my picture here. This is the esophagus behind the trachea. Here it's bifurcated into the bronchi. And this is the aorta that's just come out of the left ventricle of the heart. The heart's been taken away. Now, you can see with the aorta that it moves to the left and it arches, and that's called the aortic arch, and then starts to de descend down the thorax and then into the abdomen through the diaphragm, which I'll talk about in a sec. You can see the three main branches of the aorta. You can see the brachiocephalic, you can see the common carotid, and you can see the left subclavian. And as it moves down the aorta, it then moves behind the esophagus, and that's when we get to the thoracic esophagus. Thoracic esophagus is sitting in front of the aorta, and by that time, we've got the bifurcation of the trachea until it branches 23 odd times and it's turned from bronchi into bronchioles and then into everything it needs to turn into for the respiratory portion or the gas exchange area of the lungs. Now the thoracic esophagus, as it moves down, what you'll find is that now what we're talking about with the esophagus, 25 centimeters long, like I said, the top third is comprised of skeletal muscle. So that means you consciously control that swallowing portion or the movement of foodstuffs in the top third. The bottom two thirds is smooth muscle, which means you don't consciously control it. So what you'll find is most of the thoracic esophagus, and then as we move through the diaphragm, now the diaphragm is going to be sitting under here at around about uh, T, at around about T10, T11, or around about the seventh rib area. You're going to find that the esophagus moves through the diaphragm and turns into the abdominal esophagus. Now the abdominal esophagus is only around about 1.5 centimeters long and then it turns into the stomach, first part called the cardiac area of the stomach. A couple of things, that means it must move through a hole in the, th in the stomach called the hiatal area and you can get something called a hiatal hernia. So you can see here the esophagus going down, there's the diaphragm. What can happen sometimes is that the cardiac area of the stomach can, for whatever particular reason, fold upwards through this gap and bulge out and that's called a hiatus hernia. This can actually result in reflux which I'll talk about shortly. A couple of things is that you can also see that there are these ligaments either side or tendons either side of the esophagus that's moved through the um, diaphragm. And the one, they're both called the crust. You've got the left and right crust, and the right crust actually puts pressure on that esophagus and is one of the reasons why things do not or should not reflux up into the thoracic area of the esophagus from the abdominal region. Now, you can also see that the aorta has actually now entered the diaphragm as well. And you can see as the aorta goes through the thoracic area, it then re-enters the diaphragm, and now it's the abdominal aorta, and you can see a very important branch of the abdominal aorta here called the celiac trunk. I've spoken to you about blood supply to the stomach, to the liver, to the spleen, to the first part of the small intestines, all come from the celiac trunk here, and you're going to have the hepatic artery, you're going to have the splenic artery, you're going to have the left gastric artery. Watch that video if you want to know more about blood supply to those areas. 
So, a couple other things. Remember that as we look at the tract of the GRT, going from the mouth all the way down to the anus, four major layers being the mucus layer, the submucosal layer, the muscularis externa, and the serosal layer. You can see those here, mucus, submucus, here's the two muscle layers, and then the peritoneum, which is the serosa, anchoring it to the body cavity. In the esophagus, the mucus layer has epithelia, that's stratified squamous, squished and many layers. Why? It's there for protection. When you swallow food, it's going to graze and cut. You don't want to damage the deeper layers. Perfect. Once you get to the stomach, so this is the gastroesophageal junction. Gastro being stomach, esophageal being esophagus, junction being the part in between. And you can see that the epithelia in the stomach is simple columnar. That's because these columnar cells produce mucus and bicarbonate, which neutralizes the acid that's produced in the stomach. That also means that if they're not present in the esophagus, they can't neutralize acid. So if acid refluxes up into the esophagus, it can damage the walls here and can ultimately result in inflammation called esophagitis. It can damage the cells, change the way the cells are shaped, and that's termed Barrett's esophagitis. These cells, these stratified squamous cells, can actually turn into what looks like simple columnar cells because it's thinking, I need to protect myself. I need to turn into simple columnar to produce mucus and so forth. But in actual fact, the change in cell type is a precursor or can be a precursor to cancer, esophageal cancer. All right. Now, what we all have here at this gastroesophageal junction is a sphincter called the lower esophageal sphincter. And you can see that with the muscle layer here in the muscularis externa, there's two major types, the circular muscle which goes around the tube, when that contracts it narrows the lumen, and you've got longitudinal muscle which goes down the length, when that contracts it shortens the tube. Together they allow for peristalsis move stuff through, but here at the gastroesophageal junction the circular muscle is thickened and creates a sphincter, a nice tight enclosed area so things cannot go back up through. Now things like spicy foods, caffeine, chocolate, they can all relax that lower esophageal sphincter and what it can do is allow for gastric contents to spurt back up into the esophagus, damaging the cells, potentially resulting uh, esophagitis, Barrett's esophagitis and also cancer ultimately. If chronically exposed, this may happen. Okay, I think that's going to be enough when we look at the anatomy of the esophagus and a little bit about gastroesophageal reflux.